morning, good morning. It's my privilege to stand before you and share the Word of God. And uh, we're going to finish our study in the book of Isaiah today. We've been going through Isaiah for, I don't know, seven, eight months. Um, I have a two-page synopsis prepared that we use in one of our Moody classes. If you, if you want that, Brother Elder Keith Madison has those. You can pick that up on your way out. It's a synopsis of all that we've covered in the book of Isaiah. And today, as we finish our study, we're gonna, we've titled our message, The Future Will Be Better Only If You're a Believer. If you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have anything to look forward to but eternal punishment because you're rejecting the love of God found in Christ Jesus. The future will be better, but only if you are a believer. God wants us to have joy throughout all eternity. He, he's created us with this ability to experience satisfaction as we seek and find the things we need to live and enjoy life, the things he has provided for us. And everything we enjoy is just a small sample size of what it's going to be like to have him satisfy us forever through an intimate relationship with him. Ever notice how finding a person that you love who was lost or separated from you and, and you get back together and it brings you great joy? It was 1978. Uh, Anita and I were, were dating and we broke up for a few months. Um, she had to learn how to listen to the Lord and, 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 and realize that, uh, that my competition was not what was best for her and that her life would have been absolutely miserable had she married someone else. So for, so for four months, we were apart. And so sweetest day came and I had taken some pictures of the flowers that I would have given her had we been together. At about that same time, she was having her eyes open and realized that uh, we should be together, so she, she called me before the flowers arrived. And as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> but, but, the, <laughs> but there's a joy in getting back together with uh, who God wants you to be with. And, and then you realize that you know, he brings folks together, not just to make you happy, but so that together you can bring him glory, enhance one another's life, and then as a byproduct, he gives you that joy that you would not find in the wrong relationship. And we say over and over when we do weddings, please notice that God brought Eve to Adam after both of them had first been alone with him. Okay? Don't, don't lose that. Okay. God has much to say about what he has prepared for those who've been lost and found. This last section, I'm going to run through these last two chapters. There's a couple things I'll dive into, but this last section of Isaiah's prophecies is an answer to his cry about how God will respond to the people who have ignored him. We saw that at the end of chapter 64, this cry, Lord, would you come? Would you manifest yourself? What's going to happen to us who've been ignoring you and, and rejecting you? Remember the people at this time would have been coming back from captivity. Their land had been devastated by, by war. They'd been away for decades. And, and so Isaiah is going to acknowledge that the punishment is deserved but the people needed a word of reminder about what the future could hold if they stayed close to the Lord. Well, the Bible's open to Isaiah chapter 65. We've entitled this first section, Those Who Ignore the Lord Will Suffer Consequences. Those Who Respond to His Invitation Will Be Blessed Abundantly. The text says, I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called 
by my name. I've stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. A people who provoke me to anger continually to my face, who sacrifice in gardens, burn incense on altars of bricks, sit among the graves, spend the night in the tombs, who eat swine's flesh and the broth of abominable things is in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, don't come near to me. As old King James said, I'm holier than thou. <laughs> God says, there is smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. The Lord wants to reach people so badly that many who weren't looking for him will hear his invitation and respond. Ever been in a, in a mall, in a crowded place, in, a, in an event where a lot of people, and you, you hear this parent hollering, here I am, here I am. Everybody looks to see who's hollering. Now, they're hollering typically for, for a child or, or someone who they've lost contact with, but the fact that they're shouting, here I am, everybody tends to look and notice who's calling. You see God's illustration? He, he's saying, I'm, I'm calling out, and, and people who weren't even looking for me are going to find me. He's trying to tell the Israelites, you know, some of the Gentile nations who didn't have a relationship with me, they're going to respond before you do. They weren't even looking for me. See, God graciously allows people to find him. Not that he was lost. But this is his way of saying, I'm going to call, I'm going to invite, and, and people who didn't even realize that they were separated from me are going to respond to my invitation, and yet some of my own people who should have known better are sitting in my face. You see that in verse 2, he said, all day long I have stretched out my hands in invitation to a rebellious people who walk in their own way according to their own thoughts, provoking me to anger continually to my face. Just having the audacity to sin right in the sight of a holy God and think nothing's going to happen. God said they're sacrificing to idols out in these garden places burning incense on altars of brick, things he didn't command them to do, sitting among the graves, spending the night in the tombs. What, what they were doing is, is similar to what you see people doing today when they have uh, a seance. They're, they're out amongst the graves trying to consult with people who are dead, trying to get information from the spirit world. Instead of going to the Holy Spirit, they wind up getting information from demonic spirits. Eating swine's flesh, we're gonna, gonna talk about that in a moment. The broth of abominable things in their vessels. Can you imagine eating soups of unclean animals? Literally some rodents and things. They were, all these things God told them not to do, they were doing in his face. And then thinking they were so holy that no one else should come near them. These self-righteous sinners turn away from the Lord and turn off others who may want to know him. God says they, they irritate me like toxic smoke irritates us. Can, can you imagine your next door neighbor fire up the grill and the smoke keeps drifting in, in your yard and they never put any food on the grill. And day after day after day, I mean the smoke just keeps coming towards you and getting in your nostrils and causing you to cough and becoming toxic and yet there's never anything that comes from it. And God is saying these self-righteous sinners are irritate me like smoke and nostrils and they dare to think they're holier than everybody else wow 
Do you attract people to Jesus or do you repel them? Do they look at you and say, if that's Christianity, I want no part of it. That's what a lot of people in church do. They say they know the Lord, but nothing in their life attracts people to Jesus. And you don't want that on your resume. That people looked at your life and you're the reason they didn't want to follow the God you said you believe in. All right, let's, let's dive into this comment about the diet. For decades and decades and decades, we've had this conversation about the difference between healthy eating and what the Bible says we can and cannot eat. Okay? I have to, I'm going to run through about 10 scriptures, okay? You, you, know the, you know the creation, right? So before the fall. Y'all looking at those ribs. Okay, so, so, so before the fall, <laughs> humans and animals all ate what was grown from the ground. Okay. Then after the fall, suddenly the animals are carnivorous praying on one another. The whole creation fell when we fell. Then comes a flood, and you recall in Genesis chapter 9, verse 5 and verse 6, God told Noah and his family, from this point, every living thing that moves shall be food for you. But don't you dare eat the food with its lifeblood in it. Why did he say that? Because now he's teaching us a principle that in order for us to live, something else, someone else has to die. See that? After the fall, he now begins to teach the lesson that life comes because someone else sacrificed for you. Okay? Then he calls Abraham hundreds of years later. And from him starts the Hebrew nation. Still no dietary restrictions. Until after Moses and the Exodus, and he calls them out of Egypt, and now you get these other laws about what the Jewish people can eat and not eat. It begs the question, why? Leviticus 11.7, Deuteronomy 14.18, one of the things he says you can't eat was, was the swine. But there are a lot of other animals and birds he said you can't eat. And he gave some distinguishing characteristics about all of them. And, and so one of the things he wanted his people to do was learn from their lifestyles. Some of the animals he said you can't eat, he called them ceremonially unclean the raven and, and the swine and the vulture. And, other. and so they had to look and say, wow, they have no discrimination about what they eat. But the cow chews its cud and, and if you will, meditates and, and brings it up again. And, and so sometimes those are the spiritual lessons he wanted them to learn. Only the Jewish people had the dietary restrictions. Okay? Then you get to the New Testament. And Jesus is, is trying to explain what they had missed. Mark chapter 7, you see him talking to the Pharisees, and he, he called them, you know, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside. But on the inside, you're like dead men's bones. He said, don't, don't you realize that what you put in your mouth isn't what defiled you, it's what was coming out of your heart. And then in parentheses said, thereby he said all foods were clean. Okay. Acts chapter 10, he's trying to get Peter to go to the Gentiles, and he gives them this vision of all these animals coming down on a sheet. What did he say? Rise, Peter. What's the next word? Kill and eat. What did Peter say? Oh, Lord, I've never eaten these unclean foods. And God said, how dare you call unclean something I've cleansed? What was the point of that? He was sending him to the Gentiles. 
there was no way he was going to reach them without fellowship, without having meals with them, without interacting with them. And so he had called their diets unclean and them unclean. And God said, no, you should have learned the lesson by now. It wasn't the food. It was what was coming out of the human heart. So now, go fellowship. Eat with them. Mingle with them. Lead them to me. Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Go be with them. Did you, did you notice in the Old Testament, even the, the, the meats he said they could eat, he said if you kill that animal when you're hunting, you can eat it. But if you come upon him and he's already dead, you can't eat it. Because you don't know why he's dead. Something inside of him may have killed him, and if you eat it, it's going to kill you. See, there's always spiritual lessons behind these doctrinal truths. Two, two verses I'm going to have you look at. We're talking about the difference between what God says you can eat and what's just healthy for you. My man Adam's here. He'll tell you about some, some healthy food. But I want to make sure that you understand the difference between what the Bible says you can or cannot eat versus what Scripture says, okay? Still make wise choices, okay? Y'all knew if I, if I said something about ribs, I had to say something, okay? <laughs> All right, Colossians 2. <laughs> Hurry, folks, got a lot to cover today. Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 14. No, it's verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses... And the uncircumcision of your flesh. He's made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. He disarmed principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Let no one judge you in food or in drink regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. They're just a shadow of things to come. The substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility, worship of angels, intruding into those things which he's not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head, of course, that's Christ, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all concern things which, watch this, perish with the using. Mm -hmm. See, all these things that have attracted your attention about what I can touch, not touch, eat, not eat, drink, not. God said you're, you're making an idol God out of, out of something that as soon as you consume it, it's gone. Are you doing all these things according to the commandments and doctrines of men? They've got an appearance of wisdom, verse 23, in self-imposed religion. False humility, neglecting of the body, but of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Okay? First Timothy chapter 4. Did I say Adam or Arthur? I'm sorry. What about the... You said Adam. Or I'm sorry. My man Arthur. Okay. <laughs> I, knew, I knew both of them when they were about this tall. So, you know. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 4. From verse 1 to verse 6. Watch this. Now the Spirit speaks expressly, clearly, saying in the latter days some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared, with a hot iron, do you realize some people sin against the Lord so much that their consciences don't even bother them? They become cauterized and insensitive. Look at some of the things Paul said they will be doing. They'll be forbidding you to get married and commanding you to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. See, some people just don't understand the truth 
about what God has said we can have or not have. Okay, look at verse 4. For every creature of God is good. Nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving and sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you've carefully followed. Reject those profane and old wise fables. Exercise yourself toward godliness. Bodily exercise profits for a little while. But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that is now and that of which is to come. Okay? Back to Isaiah chapter 65. These people were sinning in the face of a holy God and thinking they were holier than everybody else and to become absolutely repulsive to people who needed to know him. All right, let's pick up the pace. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 6 says, Behold, it's written before me, I won't keep silence, I will repay, even repay into their bosom your iniquities and iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord, who burned incense on the mountains and blasphemed me on the hills. Therefore, I will measure their former work into their bosom. For thus says the Lord, as a new wine is found in the cluster, one says, don't destroy it, there's a blessing in it. So will I do for my servant's sake that I may not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob, from Judah, as heir, an heir of my mountains. My elect shall inherit it, my servants shall live there. Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, the valley of Acor, a place for herds to lie down for my people who have sought me. Let us see God judges people based upon their response to him. Everybody's a sinner. The, the only difference is whether or not you'll respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody's good enough to go to heaven. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God says the determining factor is how you respond to my invitation of salvation, my grace offered to you through Jesus Christ. The ungodly will suffer punishment in this life and the life to come, but the redeemed ones will be spared and enjoy what the Lord has provided. He used that illustration. Don't destroy all, all those great. There, there's some good ones in that cluster. Lord, don't destroy them all. Yes, I know that. There can be one person in a crowd that God sees that will respond and he will spare because of that person. Remember how Abraham was in, interceding for, for Sodom and Gomorrah? And he said, Lord, is, if there's 50, will you spare? Sure. How about 40? How about 30? God always sees the remnant. He knows how to spare. He talks about how things will be changed. The Valley of Achor in verse 10, you recall, that's where Achan and his family were killed because they lied and, and stole things that God said don't touch. And the children of Israel suffered a, a defeat. But a couple times in Scripture here in Hosea, God says, I'll turn that same valley of trouble into a place of hope once you turn back to me. Okay. Verse 11, those who are, for, but though, <clears throat> excuse me, but you are those who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for Gad, furnish a drink offered for Mene. Therefore, I'll number you to the sword. You're all by thou to the slaughter because when I called, you didn't answer. When I spoke, you didn't hear, but did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. Letter D on your handout, section one. Many have forsaken the Lord and worshiped the gods of, and you saw the names in the New King James, Gad and many. It's like saying fortune and, and destiny. You're depending on what people call luck. You're depending on what people call fate. Instead of responding to the call of God. That's what he's chasing in his people for. And listen carefully. You, you hear people to this day. Some who even say they're Christians, you listen to, him, to them. This is what they're saying. Oh, I, I hope my luck, this, this happened for me. To, really? You know a sovereign God and you want to depend on something called luck? 
And you want to accept a, the fate that you think is inevitable because of your lifestyle choices instead of repenting and watching the God who can bring life out of death change what you think is your destiny? Don't go there. Therefore, thus says the Lord, verse 13, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you'll be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you'll be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, you'll be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart, and wail for grief of spirit. You shall leave your name as a curse to my chosen, for the Lord God will slay you and call his servants by another name. So that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. He who swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hidden from my eyes. The Lord's going to provide for his children while the rebels are going to experience grief and sorrow. One day, all the former troubles of this life will be forgotten. Question, are you looking forward to that day? Do you, do you really have something to look forward to? Do you know your future is going to be better because you've trusted Jesus Christ? Let's move on. The Lord will do an extreme makeover of the heavens and the earth. Will you be around to enjoy it? Look at verse 17, he said, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. Behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. Watch this. For the child shall die 100 years old. The sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. Remember last week we talked about oak trees we know of that have lived hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. My elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Not, they shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. They shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. Bottom of your handout, we need to spend a minute here. The new heavens and the new earth will be renovated for the millennial kingdom and later recreate it for eternity. Why do we say it that way? Because did you notice Isaiah just said that if someone dies at 100 years old, it'll be like a child dying. So some sinners will die at 100 because they've done something and the Lord took them out. But in eternity, there'll be no more death. So this has to be the renovated Millennial kingdom where earth is restored to those Garden of Eden-like conditions that were conducive to long life. And Jesus reigning and ruling in righteousness, there'll be that longevity that God had intended from beginning. Remember the original body said Adam and Eve not sinned, they would have lived forever. But even after sin, did you notice, and I put Genesis 5 on your, your handout, at least I meant to, um, You've got Adam living 930 years. You've got Methuselah living 969 years. You, you, all that list in Genesis 5, please notice, 7, 8, 900 years of longevity. Moses having, Moses, Noah having children after age 500. And, but then... <laughs> the thought of changing diapers and you're 800 years old. But anyway... But that's how long people were living. That will be the norm again in the millennial kingdom. But there'll still be death, which means this can't be the new heavens and the new earth where nothing but righteousness will be forever. Okay? There's some other verses there on your, your handout. You can look. We read Revelation 21. Okay, Second Peter chapter 3, real quick. Second Peter chapter 3.
Pastor Rafael said we didn't have to hurry, so I'm going to preach as long as he does. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 <laughs> Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 1. The Word of God says, Behold, and now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last day, walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Verse 5, for this they willfully forget. They choose to ignore that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by that same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Very quickly, he said, one way to know that you're in the last days is people are going to be mocking you, saying, y'all been talking about this second coming of Christ forever. And nothing's changed since the creation. And he says they are choosing to ignore an obvious truth. God destroyed this world before with a flood and only saved eight human beings. And he said that same God who destroyed the world by water before, next time it's going to be by fire. The only reason it hasn't happened because he's merciful and gracious. Look at verse 8. But beloved, don't forget this one thing, that with the Lord a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but he's long-suffering towards us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's just giving you time to repent. But one day it'll be too late. Verse 10. But that day will come. As a thief in the night. Thief in the night means you're caught off guard. Happens when you're not looking for it. What's going to happen? The heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. It's going to happen. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, since you know this is going to come, what kind of people should you be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of that day of the Lord because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, those of us who are saved, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. See, God's original creation was been contaminated by sin. Lucifer sinned in heaven. But one day he's going to purge all sin out of his creation and there will never, ever again throughout all eternity be one act of sin and rebellion committed. We have something to look forward to. Back of your hand out, back to Isaiah 65. Jerusalem will one day be the center of rejoicing because the Lord will be present there. During the millennial kingdom, long life will be the norm as in the early years of the human race. The day will come when all labor will be fruitful. The Lord who knows our needs will answer prayer while his children are still asking. Look, look at that. Verse 24, Isaiah 65. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Isn't that beautiful? God says before they get the words out of their mouth, I'm, I'm going to answer the prayer. And actually, when you look at um, Matthew 6, when he's, when he's teaching the disciples how to pray, remember he said, yeah, 
You know, you don't need to impress me with all the, the verbiage. I know what you need before you even ask me. You come to me in faith and ask according to my will, and you have your answer. Okay? Something else to look forward to, verse 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. Dust shall be the serpent's food. Shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. During that kingdom, the, the animals who now prey upon one another won't do that anymore as in the beginning. That curse will be removed. Deadly pets will be safe then. Please wait. Please wait until that time before you choose to make lions and tigers and cobras your pets. If you want a tiger, you know, make sure he's on a cereal box or something. But <laughs> we're told that over 1,500 attacks have happened since 1990 of exotic pets attacking their owners. At least 75 deaths the last we saw. Really? You know, get, get a cat, not a lion. <laughs> the, the nature of that animal has not changed. And just because you've tamed it doesn't mean at some point its true nature may not rise up again. Just like you, when you don't allow the Holy Spirit to dominate, control, subdue, crucify your old nature, what happened? You did something you hadn't done, hadn't said in 20 years, and so, that quickly came out. If you do that, what makes you, and you have the Holy Spirit living in you, what makes you think that lion is always going to behave? 1,500 attacks. 75 deaths because people couldn't wait to the millennial kingdom. See, that's the danger of not knowing the context of scripture. You, you can't say this is going to happen right now. Read the context. This is the kingdom. Okay, I digress. Chapter 66. <laughs> Last section. True worshipers will be acknowledged. Rebels will be destroyed. Thus says the Lord, heaven's my throne, earth is my footstool. Where's the house that you'll build me? Where's the place of my rest? All those things my hand has made, all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who's poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. As the people came back, as we've been studying in Haggai and the Minor Prophets, that building the temple was always central to their worship. The Lord had to remind them that he cannot be contained by building. Okay. He said, heaven's my throne, earth is my footstool. How are you going to build a house and think that's the only place I can be contained in? And you're using materials that I created. But even though I'm high and holy and exalted, as he said in Isaiah 57, I choose to live with those who are humble of a contrite spirit and tremble, who respect and honor my word. It's God's intention to live in the human heart if you trust Jesus Christ. Make a home for him like he's made for you. Verse 3, chapter 66 says, He who kills a bull is as if he killed a man. As as if he killed a man. He who sacrifices a lamb, it's as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering, as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense, as if he blesses an idol, just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. So I will choose their delusions and bring their fears on them, because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. 
Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hated you, cast you out from my name, said, sake said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. They shall be ashamed. What he's saying there is, look at letter B on section three. The, the, the time's going to come that he says, I'm going to bring strong delusion and deception upon these people. Their, their sacrifices are are not acceptable to me. He's saying, you, you kill a bull, as far as I'm concerned, you murdered an innocent human being. You bring a lamb, as far as I'm concerned, you may as well have broken a dog's neck. I'm not receiving any of this. I'm going to send you strong delusion because you choose to reject my word. Delusion will be worldwide during the tribulation period for all who have rejected the truth. You, you guys do remember that, right? From 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says after the Holy Spirit is, is text says, is taken out of the way, he's removed his church, he's stopped restraining evil in the way that he's doing now, and that's when the Antichrist can be manifested, and God says all those who chose to ignore the gospel truth will be deceived. If you reject the truth, there's nothing else to receive but the lie. And God says, I will, send, I will send that strong delusion because the people chose to reject the gospel. We are seeing previews of that in our day. Do you see how many people are deceived, completely deceived by what people are saying? This is a preview of how it's going to be in the end times when God gives even more leeway to the demonic spirits, to empower leaders, and the Antichrist in particular, so that people will believe lies because they didn't embrace the truth when they had the opportunity. It's sad to watch the news and see people willing to sacrifice their lives for what we clearly see are lies. But the only reason we see it, not because we're smarter than anybody else, is because the spirit of truth lives in the child of God. He's going to send that strong delusion for those who reject the gospel. Let's move on. Sound of the noise, verse 6, the sound of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who will repay his enemies. Remember right before that, they're being mocked. Hey, where's your God? Give him some praise. We want to see how you handle this. <laughs> okay. You've been messing with my people. I'm going to mess with you. It's going to happen so quickly. Look at verse 7. Before she was in labor, she gave birth before her pain came. Some of you mothers would really rejoice in that, wouldn't you? In labor, gave birth before the pain. Who's heard of such a thing? Who's seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in a day? Shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause the delivery, says the Lord? Shall I who cause delivery shut up the womb, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem. Be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you who mourn for her, that you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom that you may drink deeply and be lighted with the abundance of her glory. Quick picture. The Lord is going to vindicate his holy name in the city he's chosen. He said, I'm going to bring Israel to life in a moment. Remember, the church is raptured. And that's when he raises up those 144,000 Jewish evangelists who he already has scattered around the world so they can share the gospel when the church is removed in a moment. And Paul says, I'm the example. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, 8, he said, I'm like one who was born out of due time. One moment he's on his way to Damascus to persecute the saints, then he encounters Jesus, and now he's working for the church. He said, I'm a picture of how quickly the nation is going to be brought to life in the end times. He is the God who can give birth in an instant. He's going to give birth to a nation of believers in an instant. It's going to happen. One day Jerusalem will be the place where the Lord reigns and rules and people want to go up there to, to see him. Last section. 
When you see this, verse 14, your heart shall rejoice, your bones shall flourish like grass. The hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants and his indignation to his enemies. Behold, the Lord will come with fire, with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by a sword, the Lord will judge all flesh. The slain of the Lord shall be many. Those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, says the Lord. If I know their works and their thoughts, it shall be that I will gather all nations and languages. They shall come and see my glory. I'll set a sign among them and those among them who escape, I will send to the nations. Tarshish, Paul, Lud, who draw the bow, Tubal, and Javon to the coastlands afar of off, who have not heard my fame or seen my glory. They shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Just another way I'm saying I'm bringing people from all over to recognize that the king is in Jerusalem. Verse 20, they shall bring all your brothers for an offering to the Lord out of all the nations on horses and chariots and lighters in litters, on mules, and on camels, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord. As the children of Israel bring an offering and a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And I will also take some of them for priests and Levites. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I shall make will remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your descendants and your name remain. And it will come to pass that from one new moon to another... From one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. But sadly, look at this last verse. They shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die. Their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. What a contrast. Isaiah ends this book with a graphic description of judgment against those who refuse the grace of God and how they will suffer eternal punishment. You know throughout the Bible they, they use this garbage dump in, in Gehenna that they, they use it as an illustration of hell. And the language was the, the worms don't die because there's always something for them to feed on. And he, he uses that illustration for human beings who reject the love of Christ, who won't be annihilated, but will exist forever in conscious torment because they rejected the gospel. Why trade in a few years of what you think is fun? Doing the sin of your choice and then spending eternity like that. Don't you want this picture where he says everybody's coming to worship and celebrate and enjoy, but over here, those who had the same opportunity and rejected it. His people will remain forever just as the new heavens and the new earth. Will your future be bitter or is it going to be better? The Lord will reign forever in his kingdom. Will you be there to enjoy it? My favorite verse from Isaiah. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. There's that great exchange. Your weakness for his strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Father, thank you for letting us see our future can be so much better and brighter if we trust Jesus. Lord, would you help us mature as disciples and have your heart so that we can evangelize and disciple others, disciple others so that they don't meet this horrific fate, that they don't spend eternity away from the God who loved them and gave himself for them. Father, give us hearts like yours. Let Jesus work in us and through us because we know that you want as many as possible to enjoy this brighter day, this better future. Thank you for making it possible. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.